Peter Chamath, Polyopatita, and I'm your boy J Cal. Sax, I gotta say, I think I think your AUM is positively correlated with the bags under your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> if you mean it's getting bigger, you're correct. I mean, fuck. Yes. They're, hi- they're heavy. <laughs> Good lord. They're heavy, <laughs> dragging you down. That's where you're hiding all that Solana in your fucking <laughs> under your eyes. Jesus. Oh. I'm a, you better clear that Solana position. What's your lockup? 24 months? <laughs> fuck no. He's trying to sell it to me on text message. <laughs> yeah, of so course we're he negoti- is. We're negoti- Negotiating <laughs> discounts. I just had the fact. Hey, the you're pod. fucking the whole thing up, bro. You don't. You don't <laughs> think to keep? I'm <laughs> hodling. I'm hodling. You think I buy hundreds of millions of dollars of anything without a discount? Everything is a discount. Everything's discounted. You want to clear that position in an LLC? Are you saying I got a billion dollars of Solana? No, bro. I'm Ooh. saying I have one, but you know, I brought it at a discount. But you're holding, correct? Ish. Yes. Okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, I Ish. mean, if something appreciate at what point is the appreciation in an asset that you've invested in early something you need to, you know, at least clear a position of and lock in a win? I mean, what what's enough? A hundred X, five hundred X? You gotta at some point bank a win, right? Well, I think you have to put things in a bucket of like, is it an investment or is it something that represents uh, an idea that you love so much? If it's the latter, you should never sell. If it's the former, yeah, you got to manage yeah. risk. And or rather, trim. you know, is it a trade or is it something you want to own? By the way, let me just clean this up because um, it, what, Solana was not a direct investment for us. What we did is we invested in um, a, in a crypto uh, venture firm called Multicoin Capital. This is back in 2017. We realized like crypto was becoming like a full-time job for us. It was a total rabbit hole. And we were like, we don't have time to figure out this like 24-7 trading stuff. But we met Kyle and Tushar, who were these two young guys. Uh, we met them through Vinny Lingham, actually. And they were creating multi-coin capital. And we actually invested, we gave them a, a million bucks at a 20 cap to help set up their firm. And then we invested in their, they had a, both a venture fund and a hedge fund. And they were like the first money into Solana. So uh. that fund, I mean, it's, it's like a 100x fund. It's just like bonkers. Crazy. And so, as a result of that, we are um, indirect beneficiaries of this huge increase in Solana. It will end up being about you know a, a billion dollars of, I think, Solana for us in terms of returns. But um, but it's, the multi coin guys determine the trading decisions on that. Yeah, and so people who don't know, Solana is a programmable, you know, Ethereum uh, competitor, I guess, and it's at fifty billion dollars or so market cap. It was trading at a dollar not long ago and now it's at 164. It's an Ethereum competitor basically for yeah. you know a smart contract platform and there's a lot of people I'd say smart money in Silicon Valley who are betting on a flippening where Solana could ultimately overtake Ethereum as the preferred platform. But even if it doesn't overtake Ethereum it you know it's the number 8 cryptocurrency right now. You know it could go there's a lot of people betting it'll go to number 3 or you know what have you. Additionally, it is a fraction of a penny for a transaction, uh, and it can do many more transactions than Ethereum. So it's, you know, technically should be much cheaper if you're buying NFTs right now, you're probably spending, you know, tens of dollars, you know, uh, in fees on Ethereum. Whereas if you did those same uh, NFTs, which some people are starting to do on Solana, they would cost a fraction of a penny. Correct, David? Or Chima. Yeah, I think the the platform is is known for being a faster, cheaper, you know, blockchain. Really, really, congratulations! And if Vinny Lingham's Instagram is any indication, he did pretty well because his Instagram suddenly turned into a world tour on private jets. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> which which pro- which island should I buy? And well, look, v- Vinny uh, was sort of like a I, I don't think he's full time in multicoin, but he was sort of a venture partner to Kyle and Tushar. And he helped set them up. This is back in 2017. He helped bring us in as the first investors. And I mean, for us, it was sort of a founder bet combined with a like a, a team, like sort of a space bet. Like we knew the cryptocurrencies were starting to be traded 24 seven. We knew it required more of like a hedge fund skill set than what we had. And um, so we made, you know, we made a bet on those guys and man, has one of the nice strategies, right? Sachs is if you are LPing in new fund managers, uh, which I've done a couple of times now, you get to learn from them uh, and basically dive into a data set of a new market, right? I mean, it's like one of the nice things about being an LP in a fund is you can place a small bet, whether it's 50k or 500k or 5 million, whatever it is. 
you you get like this meta education of an entire sector, correct? Yeah, but I think, you know, we didn't do it to learn from them, although we have. It's more that we realized that crypto was, like I said, becoming such a rabbit hole. Like we realized we, we would either need to do crypto full time as a fund or we would need to like partner with people who actually did. Yeah. And you, you see that with like a lot of VC firms now is they're creating like specialized crypto funds, or at least they have specialized crypto partners. There's so much to know about the crypto world. It's a hard thing to invest in unless you're like totally focused on it. I've struggled with that. Like I've tried to go deep on a couple topics. And like, I realized, holy shit, I've been in this for like four to six hours just trying to learn this stuff. And I'm not like there. And then I feel uncertain about making any decisions. I, I, I totally get it. I mean, you got to have folks like working on this and the, the, the pace is changing. Um, so rapidly, uh, you really need to kind of be up to date on, on what's next. It's, you know what the, uh, other, it's really, the other issue really of Freeberg is when you look at crypto, people use the word crypto as if it's like, that's all there is. Totally. Crypto that's is like, like, that's like distributed the computing, yeah, right. <laughs> e-cash, cryptography, uh, you know, financial modeling or building new economic systems, Chamath. There's business model innovation, there's technology innovation, there's economic innovation. It's uh, distributed it, computing innovation. Yeah, uh, in, infrastructure, infrastructure, hardware. I mean, there's there's quite a lot of uh, layers of activity. Chamath, are you spending time in crypto yourself? Or do you have people doing it for you? Or how are you kind of? Yeah, we have but, look, we have we have a lot of it. Um, a lot of a lot of everything. So yeah, we have things. But do you go deep yourself, Chamath? Like, how do you spend enough time to really get up to speed on all the goings on? I cherry pick and I snipe and uh, opportunities where I get intellectually curious and jump in. But a lot of the credit goes to my team. There's a couple folks that spend a lot of their time in it. And, you know, we've, we've had a couple people um, do extremely well for us, um, you know, similar, similar to David's story back in the day, you know, I invested uh, in Barry Silbert and uh, DCG Second market Barry Silbert. Yeah. And, uh, you know, DCG is now, I don't know, I'm guessing a $20 billion company. Maybe more. I don't know. So how does it mechanically work with your team? They, they are investigating opportunities and then they come to you and bring you, you know, hey, we'll do a meeting and I'm going to share four with you. And then you say, yeah, hey, let I me mean, get like, on the phone you, with that no. guy. Do you basically go deep, go deep when something shows up, Chama? No. So, so basically what happens is they have carte blanche to do whatever they want. And what they're typically doing is they're working with entrepreneurs to seed projects and, you know, to, to, to get projects off the ground. And then at some point when those, when those projects become de- uh, large enough, then they'll issue tokens and, you know, w- we'll get a certain allocation of those tokens. And so we've done that for, you know, call it, I don't know, some number of projects that we think are valuable. Then along the way, you know, they'll have certain views on Bitcoin. They'll have certain views on Ethereum. They'll have certain views on Solana and we'll make capital allocation decisions. They tend to have the ability to do whatever they want. And then what I tend to do is just think about when it gets above, like it, to me, I need to see the chance to make at least, you know, in the rough justice around, you know, 500 to a billion dollars, and then I'll get involved. But otherwise, they just kind of run the whole thing. Let me ask you guys um, a question here. You know, when you look at the uh, market caps of these projects, it seems like things are changing. Uh, Cardona or Cardana um, is number three now. And, uh, Tether still remains number five, XRP still number six, but Solana. I would encourage people to not look at it like that. I think looking at it as a rank list betrays what it is. So, you know, I'll give you a simple example. Let like, like compare the, the fate of two projects, or actually, right now there's a distributed form of um, Discord that's being built. Discord, the chat app, yeah, very popular in amongst complete, gamers. In a completely distributed way with an integrated crypto wallet. Because if you look at Discord, it's really two cohorts of people. There's gaming and there's crypto, right? So those are the two big ones, yeah. So, you know, that's an example of a really interesting product that has some real potential. Then if you look at something like DSO, DSO is a decentralized social programming framework. Then if you look at something like Helium, that's completely about building a large distributed, you know, connection of, um, of on ramps to the internet, so internet connectivity. So those are three completely different ideas with three completely different paths to success. If to invest in those tokens, you you have to believe in three totally different sets of things. 
Yes. So to look at it on a rank list and just buy something well, because it's cheap is yeah, stupid. Yeah, no, no. My, no, my no, no. I'm just going to be blunt. To, it's yeah. stupid. Don't well, do no, that. No, no, no. That wasn't really my question. My question was, you know, we we have an extraordinary number of the public who've invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum as number one and number two. And those projects feel maybe stagnant when compared to the dynamism of what I'll call you know, the projects launched in the last three or four years. Because so, they're at a different, no, no, but you're talking about confusing. Again, that's what I mean. Those are layer one protocols, right? Meaning they are at the core substrate of how all of crypto is going to work. Then you have these other projects that build on top of these things in different ways or build around them. So my point is, if you don't have, if you don't want to take the time to understand which layer twos you want to own and which layer ones you want to own and why, I think you're much better off I understand your point. My, my Buying point is Buying an ETF or something else because there are there are ways to own these things. So, for but example, the, David, the, the, David Solana is does not need Ethereum to exist. So, my point right. is, do we do we see a day when this you know the past decade has been about Bitcoin and Ethereum? Do we see a day when maybe people stop buying those and start buying these new ones? Anything's possible, but here's here's the evolution in our thinking. I mean, the, the first step was realizing, okay, we need to own Bitcoin. Why? Because, you know, there's now enough evidence where what, like a, a decade or more than a decade into this, nobody has been able to essentially counterfeit a Bitcoin. It is, you know, new money. It is it is better money. So if you so I'm not going to convince people right now of the argument for Bitcoin, but if you believe in it. That's sort of the first step is you realize you really need to have one to two percent of your portfolio in Bitcoin in the event that fiat money sort of becomes debased and eventually you move to crypto. Then you realize, well, wait a second, Bitcoin is just one application of blockchains. There's a bunch of applications of blockchains. So maybe we need to own not just sort of, you know, digital money, but we also need to own the underlying blockchain platform. And that leads you to Ethereum. Then you realize that there's a bunch of competitors to Ethereum and it's still very early days. And one of those guys might ultimately displace Ethereum as a blockchain platform. Then you realize that there's all these applications on top of all these blockchains. And so, you know, the conclusion I come to after all of that is I can't figure all this out. And well, maybe I could if I was willing to go back to school and like make this a full time job, which I just don't want to do. I mean, I'm lazy and that's why I focus on SaaS. Like that's what I know. Your kill zone. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm not going to reinvent myself. It's like you playing Hold'em versus PLO. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, but this is why we partner with Multicoin Capital. So what I would just say is like the idea that you as an individual investor are going to like, you know, pick off the one cryptocurrency here or there to invest in. I mean, that's going to be a lottery. I would, I would find a manager basically who is really good who has a track record who understands this stuff. Our approach is to hire very young, extremely technical computer scientists and mathematicians to basically do the work. That's that's working. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I think these guys do and the reason why it is very helpful for them to be computer scientists is these are all open source projects. So they go look at the repos just go look at go look you can at actually what, see the changes being yeah. made and this is like do you realize there's only 12 people who are actively working on solana in the, in the but you need to you need to look at all crazy. the code and check-ins seven you, of them work for solana you need to look at all the code check-ins you need to look at the velocity of the code check-ins yes. so you can see like how many projects are being created on these platforms the white papers are also really exceptional like if you if you read these white papers they are they're 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 really incredibly thoughtful and and well written and you can really understand what their goals are and you can make some informed decisions there but again if you're not going to be in the business of being in this ecosystem because i think david's right everything is moving so fast um what's successful today could be just a dog tomorrow and vice versa that i think speculating in this market will um, not only will it be super volatile, but more than likely you're going to lose all your money. So I would encourage people to not speculate in crypto. I would encourage you to figure out an elegant way of having an abstracted bet if to the extent you care about it. And by the way, in the UK, for example, there are ways where you can own publicly traded mutual funds that give you exposure to this. It's just like simple. ETFs. Yes. Yeah. But they're mutual funds of crypto. Do the work, find these mutual funds, just own those things and let somebody else do the hard work because it is too, it's too hard. Some of the other investments we made back in 2017, 2018 timeframe, one was uh, a company called Bitwise, which was creating an ETF for crypto. So it's a, uh, a, a, a monthly rebalanced portfolio of the, I think the top 10 cryptocurrencies. 
and you could buy it. They, they finally got approved by the SEC and you can buy it like a, uh, like with a ticker symbol from your E-Trade account. Right, your Robin Hood or E-Trade, exactly. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty incredible to see the progress they've made. And then the other big bet we made was just uh, institutional custody. Back in 2017, we invested in Bitco. Actually, Bill Lee helped found that company uh, many years ago. And then that became, last year, uh, Galaxy announced a deal to acquire them for, I think, $1.2 billion, largest crypto acquisition to date. The thesis there was just that crypto would go more institutional. And I think we're starting to see that now, where endowments and so on are realizing they need to have some portion, maybe 1% or 2% of their portfolio in crypto. And so, you know, it's they unrealistic. Need- Look, we have two almost $3 trillion of market cap in crypto. It's unrealistic for folks to expect people to be able to be living in discord channels and doing all of this work. I think what that means is that the SEC is going to be asked increasingly more often to approve simpler on ramps for this stuff. And now in the last week, by the way, we had a pretty important two things happen. Both Jerome Powell and Gary Gensler basically said, Crypto's here to stay and, and you know, we're not going to ban this stuff. And so hopefully what it means is that you get some ETFs passed in the United States. You know, grayscale is one, there could be more. And I think that stuff makes it much easier for folks to own this stuff. Well, a clear regulation would be a great thing for the industry for people to buy into it and removing some of the, let's call them, I don't want to say bad actors, but people who are maybe questionable, like Tether, you know, I don't know if you saw the Bloomberg story yesterday, but, you know, uh, a Bloomberg reporter basically found out that Tether, he got the list of what Tether owns with their stablecoin. And it looks like they're giving a lot of loans to other crypto projects and own a lot of Chinese paper um, in that they are basically making the float on $69 billion sweeping it, which then incentivizes them to take risky bets because they get paid on them. And it's anything but a stablecoin, if you think about it from that regard. It's, I don't know the details on Tether. I won't speak to that, but I'll say that any stable coin, if it's not 100% backed by dollars, if that's the currency that's going in and out or yeah. other hard currency, that's not a stable coin. Right. You know, a stable coin is supposed to be a service. It's not supposed to be a, a speculator's currency. It's basically just supposed to be a mechanism by at the on ramps and off ramps of the crypto ecosystem. You can convert your dollars into a temporary, uh, like a stable coin that will hold its poker value chip. until you can, tr- a poker chip that you can use to then buy Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever. Yeah, USDC, USDC, uh, Jeremy Allaire's uh, Circle. competitor yeah. from Circle just said that he would switch to 100% to what you're saying, cash, cash equivalents. It, uh, guys, this, is, this has always been a money market fund. It should be... Right. Treated like a money market fund and it should be regulated and managed like a money market. Which was Tether's totally original agree. vision and then they flipped the script because I think they got greedy. And now they own, I think, three and, or four. And because percent they weren't regulated. But by, by the way, by the way, it, it speaks to the role of regulation. Like, you know, a lot of people have trust and faith because they make some claim, but there's no regulator actually checking on their claims. The only people and that want regulation are at two ends of the spectrum. So young and so disruptive where they want rails to operate legally. And so big and so over the top that they want to basically entrench themselves for the rest of their lives. That's it. <laughs> no, and everybody in the middle doesn't really want regulation. Well, well, what's a uh, what's a way if to you're create a crypto company or if you're big tech, you both want regulation. Well, but <laughs> the, the, else yeah, well, there, there, but there there are some narrow cases. Like again, you know, if 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 a stable coin is going to say that we are just a money market fund, we're 100 percent dollar reserve. It is really nice to have a regulator, somebody we trust to go in there and put the stamp yeah. of approval on it FDIC. so we can trust it. Or like an that SRO. Is, that is a valid role, I think, for a regulator. In traditional financial markets, you have these self-regulating uh, bodies. Um, I, I think it's, FINRA is a self-regulating body, right? And so you know, yes. some of these self-regulating bodies should be formed in the crypto community. I don't know if they're doing this. I'm so naive in this space, but certainly would make sense to have an SRO form that that does self policing effectively within the community rather than try and bring in a government regulator. Well, here's the thing, if you police yourself, <laughs> you can uh, really uh, define the execution uh, and the ramifications of that policing. If you have 30 call it competitors and cooperators in the in the market space doing this together, it can be a, a highly effective model for creating a system of trust and, and reliability and not having to you know, bring in, you know, call it outside incompetence <laughs> to overseeing the rules and rights. Yeah, another area we need standards is around the token cap tables for these projects, right? So 
how much uh, how much of the token cap table goes to the founders what are the rules around them selling what are the vesting periods and what are the disclosures around them selling in public markets we have 10b5 so if you're an insider who runs these companies you have to disclose when you're selling there's no similar rule for crypto i think there probably should be right like if you own the if you own the token and you run this project as publicly traded and the public can buy it you should really probably have to disclose your your sales yes and maybe um you know these th it's very strange because they're running foundations and i had a crypto person on from a music crypto project and he said they had like three or 400 million in this project in Panama. I was like, who's on the board of that? And he's like, I can't say. And I'm like, why can't you say? And he said, security reasons. I was like, well, anybody who's on a public board has to be public. And of course, they have, sec you know, people who are on the board of GE or IBM or Amazon, they have security issues, like they deal with their security issues. That doesn't mean they don't disclose who they are. He's like, yeah, I'm not comfortable saying who they are. And it's like, okay, well, they sold three or 400 million. I was like, how do they give that money out? I'm like, he's like, I'm not sure I'm not on it. I'm like, what? Like there's some organization in Panama that's, uh, it was really weird. And, so and I think the one right. thing that I'll say positively about, about these crypto founders is that they uh, will never allow a single venture investor to clog up their cap table, number one. They do a great job of creating these large, broad syndicates of participation when they seed their projects. And then, you know, a lot of it goes into treasury where then they issue coins as needed. And I think that that strategy actually is very pro employee and pro ecosystem. So, you know, when we see these projects, all these companies tend to raise, you know, three, four, five million bucks, it all tends to be at like 30 million pre, and it all tends to be uh, distributed. So like, you know, you know, it's us and Reese and Sequoia. And it's like, you know, we put in 200 grand each or 400 grand each, you know, that's why you're forced to then go into the market if you believe in a project, and then spend hundreds of millions of dollars to buy into it after the fact. And I think that that's very, um, very powerful. It's a really important dynamic that if it comes back to uh, traditional venture could be really disruptive. Why? Well, could you imagine a, a SaaS founder that basically all of a sudden says, all right, you know what, I'm raising a $6 million Series A, you know, Kraft can take 500k, Sequoia, you can have 500k, um, you know, blah, 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 folks, and then you raise 6 million bucks that way. And you never allow anybody to have more than call it, you know, a few percent of a company. So the fact that it's like a it's like a mini IPO, it's like a private IPO on Sand Hill Road. Yeah. And, th and then your board construction looks entirely different. And then as yep. a result, you know, founder protections probably go way up. Employee protections probably go way up. It's and actually governance it, goes way down. Uh, no, I actually think what will happen is you're less likely in a round like that to be okay with some dork dingleberry joining your fucking board, you're going to actually point to some industry expert and say, this person is joining my board. She does XYZ job at such and such a startup. And then the investors say, wow, well, that's a pretty great advocate for the business. Go ahead and do that. Uh, another thing I learned about this whole token space was when I talked to Anatoly from uh, Solana, when they sold their three or 400 million uh, tokens to fund uh, the company, because they consider them utility tokens, not shares, they paid taxes on it. So the IRS is getting massive oh, wow. amounts of tax revenue. Well, think about it. They're selling the token. It's supposed to be for utility. Well, therefore, it's a taxable event. That actually was really smart. That is showing, I think, some wisdom because there's a lot of founders who want to have their cake and eat it too, which is to say they want to say that these are utility tokens um, and, and they don't pay tax. And then they, when they later get traded, they want to say that they're not, you know, they're not securities. But so when does the tax get paid? I think it's really smart to pay the tax up front to establish that this is a corporate sale. They're basically paying the corporate tax, right? Yes. That is what is because this is this is the problem is if if you wait until they're traded publicly and then say, no, 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 no they're they're utility tokens, not security tokens, the government's gonna ask you, well, why didn't you pay corporate income tax when you sold them, right? So that that is actually showing some perspicacity, I think. Uh can somebody look that word do, up do, for yeah, me? Do you know that Foresightedness, J. Cal. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so great that you have the two producers on either side of you right now feeding you <laughs> vocabulary words. Well done.